like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians on whose land the Australian National University sits and from whose lands I'm speaking to you today, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples, as well as the traditional custodians of the lands on which each of you live, work and learn. The First Nations people of Australia have had an intimate relationship with this landscape for thousands of years. They have met on country to learn and share knowledge, to talk and to listen, and to discuss ideas and solve problems. And they have used that knowledge and those ideas to care for the country and to practice law thousands of years before the systems of electoral law and processes that we come here tonight to discuss came into being. As we come together tonight, I'd like to pay my respects to the elders of this country, past and present, and to the culture, knowledge, kinship and connection that they hold in relationship to country. I am so pleased to welcome you all tonight to the annual Geoffrey Sawyer Lecture here at the Australian National University. This is the 25th annual Sawyer Lecture, a series established to honour Geoffrey Sawyer, the first professor of law at the Australian National University. Sawyer was a distinguished constitutional lawyer and had a keen interest in all proceedings of government, including writing on elections. This makes our distinguished lecturer tonight all the more appropriate. We are very honoured to have the Australian Electoral Commissioner, Tom Rogers, to deliver the lecture tonight. Tom was first appointed the Australian Electoral Commissioner in 2014. Before that appointment, he had served in the Australian Army in various capacities, including as commander of a UN observer mission on Golan Heights, worked for Raytheon Australia, leading the team that delivered the Sydney Olympics major preparedness and readiness activity, and served as executive director of the Australian Federal Police's Australian Institute of Police Management. Tom's experience in managing complex and challenging situations left him in good stead for the immense logistical challenges of our elections. And the Australian Electoral Commission team under his command successfully delivered the 2016, 2019 and 2022 federal elections and of course our most recent referendum. But elections are only getting more complex. During the pandemic we saw a spread of what I call transnational human rights claims, whereby the same rhetoric was used at anti-lockdown anti -lockdown rallies, whether they were held in New York, in Berlin, in Rome or in Sydney. Such messages, often amplified and spread on social media, made erroneous and often nonsensical claims to various international law documents, to the US Constitution, to the Magna Carta, uh, to the rights of so-called sovereign citizens. While the legal basis for these claims was not very effective, what was compelling was the near uniformity of the messaging, how it gained traction with disaffected groups in many different countries, and how pervasive it became. Elections, too, have not been unaffected by the impact of social media. By the same processes, conspiracies are shared, theories take root, fact can be replaced by fiction, and the job of an electoral commissioner becomes that much harder. Today, Tom's lecture is titled The Curse of the Sausage, Laws, Expectation and Complexity in Modern Elections. He will discuss how elections have evolved in the era of social media and how the Australian Electoral Commission has established a reputation management system to help safeguard the integrity of elections. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Tom Rogers. Well, our nightmares have us occasionally confronting horrifying situations perhaps being chased by zombies, or if you're in the bureaucracy like me, being hunted by Senate estimates, rendered live as a ferocious animal. If I was asked to nominate a, a nightmare situation, I'd probably cite an incident I recall from around 2006, and by an extraordinary series of very improbable misadventures, an unlucky individual arriving at the BBC in London for a job interview was ushered immediately and very mistakenly into a TV studio for a live chat. Now it goes without saying that as a non-lawyer, he was totally unqualified for an interview focusing on copyright law and Apple Computer's court case with the Beatles record label. For those that care to look it up, the attendant video clip shows the full horror of the unfolding disaster and the look of utter misery on the interviewee's face. Fancy, I remember thinking to myself, ever being caught like that. Imagine being uniquely unqualified to talk about a complex legal issue to a group of incredibly qualified individuals, but nonetheless having to do so. Golly, I thought, I hope that never happens to me. 
So on that note, thank you for the very kind invitation uh, and honour of presenting this 25th Geoffrey Sawyer Lecture. And like that surprised fellow from the BBC interview, I find myself shocked as a non-lawyer to be talking about our nation's electoral system at such a prestigious event. Now, I was heartened, though, by comments about Professor Sawyer from previous lectures, such as Michael Coper and Sir Ninian Stephen. They praised his prodigious intellect, but also emphasised his humanity and his informality. Indeed, Michael Coper referred to him as not so much a lecturer as a raconteur. So given his reported penchant for anecdote, I hope he would approve of me using this as a practitioner's pulpit this evening. The lecture will be neither academic nor legal, but will hopefully give you a frontline view of the beating heart of Australia's democratic machinery, our elections. Um, and just as an aside, whenever I mention Sir Ninian's name, it brings back other nightmare uh, memories for me. As a very junior captain in the army um, and a temporary aide to Sir Ninian, I nearly caused him to miss a plane. Uh, and as we were driving out to Canberra Airport, uh, I still remember as we both looked at a plane that we both thought was his, the penetrating gaze he gave me, uh, and I still remember trying to sink into the seat so I'd magically disappear, but anyway, I digress and that's not relevant for this evening. So the short title of my lecture this evening is The Curse of the Sausage, and in addition uh, to trying to catch your attention, it's also an attempt to explain how the iconography of the democracy sausage, or the ballot falafel if you're a vegetarian or vegan, and all it culturally conjures of a peaceful festival of democracy is almost in equal measure helpful and hindrance. Helpful in that it reminds us that Australian elections are world renowned for their transparency, their inclusivity, trust and mostly bipartisan support. Hindrance in that a focus on that simple sausage can obscure the very real and growing complications of running such a fraught and complex national event. Relevant to this lecture, that includes the complexity of the changing information landscape caused by Australian citizens' ubiquitous use of social media. And just to be very clear, uh, I'm in no way condemning that development, I'm just noting it, and it's something we need to work on. I don't want to spend all of our collective time this evening just admiring the problem, talking about what we're doing uh, and what needs to be done, but I promise we'll get there. Sadly for this audience, I am a great admirer of that most quotable of military strategists, Sir Basil Adele Hart, and I'm particularly fond of his maxim that the longest way round is frequently the shortest way there. So with that excuse for long-windedness, long I hope to achieve quite a few other things along the way tonight. I hope to briefly explain to you the absolute complexity, bordering on chaos, of modern election delivery. And I want to outline my view of the three electoral epochs that have got us here. And just for the record, if we had a slightly longer lecture, I'd probably say it's four epochs, but for tonight, let's just work with three. I also hope to leave you at least partially comforted that our electoral system is buttressed and coddled by a very strong legislative framework. This supports election delivery and is in turn supported by parliamentary oversight, independent office holders, sound operational practice, uh, and a general sense that elections in Australia are owned by all citizens. A discordant note may occur when I remind everybody of why trust is the real currency of the realm and how social media usage may be devaluing or at least tarnishing that coin. So the obvious starting point um, to get us all underway is, should I actually be here tonight? Should the AEC actually have a voice? Um, the negative of that argument is the AEC should simply focus on delivering elections. And perhaps that argument could be best understood using an analogy where election administration is mechanical uh, and a process conducted in one of those large, old-style railway switching yards. Now, I grew up very near a railway station with one of those control boxes when I was a kid, and I remember being absolutely fascinated by the gleaming apparatus and the oiled levers that controlled a very complex uh, series of events in an equally complex network. So in that overly simplified analogy, the AEC only has our hands on relatively few of the levers. There are now so many other factors exerting a fundamental influence on election delivery that regardless of how furiously we move the switches and twiddle the dials, we don't own all the machinery, in which case, the analogy goes, we should stick to talking about delivery only. I think the better view is that the role of the AEC is so democratically fundamental that we do and should comment on key electoral trends. Professor Tham from Melbourne Law School has noted 
that the AEC has a broad responsibility for electoral processes. And he's also pointed out that the Commonwealth Secretariat in London has also uh, focused on that and has spoken about any nation's electoral body being the custodian of the legitimacy of the key, fra key phase in the democratic process. And I think that's an important thing that I back up. That view is also reinforced by the broad responsibilities for the Commission outlined in Section 7 of our Act, which include advising a wide range of entities, conducting research, promoting awareness and publishing material on matters relating to our functions. So with that established, um, I think an understanding of the complexity of modern elections is critical to advancing a shared consideration of current issues. A well-meaning senior colleague from another department once said to me, really, old boy, how hard can it be? A month's work every three years, organising a church hall, a few elderly people to work there, and a bit of paper. Now, not surprisingly, I don't support that view, um, and uh, uh, nor, I think, would a large number of people in the audience who are involved in actually delivering those events. I can tell you, using the recent referendum as my hot off the press example, in fact so hot off the press we're still delivering it and counting as we speak, the logistical underpinnings of modern election delivery are simply mind-boggling. For the referendum just gone, we established more than 7,000 static polling places, 500 early voting centres, 100 overseas voting locations and 50 large count centres. We polled in over 800 premises in remote and very remote parts of Australia by travelling 214,000 kilometres with 63 teams moving by car, plane, helicopter and occasionally boat. We printed 21 million ballot papers and distributed nearly 13 million booklets with the aim being of reaching every household in Australia with that information. Additionally, much of our information was translated into approximately 54 languages including many Indigenous languages. We also filled approximately 100,000 positions by employing and training tens of thousands of everyday Australians, a huge undertaking in and of itself. So in the end, uh, just to explain how big that is, over 6 million people voted before polling day, over 7 million people voted on the day, and more than 1.7 million have voted by post so far, given that uh, postal votes can still arrive until tomorrow afternoon. So that means, if we think about it for a moment, over 14 million Australians physically came through our doors over a two week period, 14 million, extraordinary. So to try and uh, make this a little more comprehensible, I'm led to believe that the average wedding in Australia is reportedly about 100 people. So for our election, it's a little like organising about 140,000 weddings. The difference being, it's a few weeks out, we don't know the venues or who will work or cater for the event, or even who the participants or frankly the celebrants might be. All we know is that there's likely to be the same high expectations, anxiety and grief that occasionally attend family events. I'm sure you know that all of this is planned and coordinated by a small permanent team of dedicated election professionals working extraordinary hours and accepting huge operational risks on behalf of the Commonwealth, including finalising the details of that mammoth event in a very few short weeks. It really is one of Australia's most complex peacetime logistic events. And whenever I think about that, I'm very much reminded that I am the CEO of one of the world's last great analogue events in an era where citizens have digital expectations, which we'll talk about a little later. Of course, importantly, in addition to our work, there are also thousands of campaign workers and scrutineers observing the process. And finally, perhaps in keeping with our theme, we should also note that at the same time that we're administering the event, community groups cook about 360,000 kilos of sausages. Now that's a very rough estimate, don't hold me to that. I have a calculation of how I've worked that out, but that's what I reckon. So how do we land on that election model? And to understand that, uh, let's look at the broad sweep of our electoral story and what I think are our three epochs. And I want to do a very brief stop in the medieval period along the way. So the concept of a free and fair election arguably dates to the Statute of Westminster from 1275. Now, modern elections are obviously unrecognisable from that time, but we can recognise the principles behind the language of the king commandeth upon great forfeiture 
that no man shall disturb any to make free elections. Several Australian scholars and jurists have pointed out um, that uh, it's not too much of a stretch to see uh, some of the extant legislation now as a reflection of that statute. It's also not too much of a stretch to hold a mirror up to Edward I statute and see the misty outline of some of those modern electoral offences that we're aware of, like electoral bribery, political liberty, misleading publications, prohibited conduct in and near polling places, and the establishment of an independent election management body. As an aside, the drafters of that statute, if they were looking through a reverse mi mirror, would be bemused by the prescriptive legislative framework applying to Australian elections. As my former colleague, the late Peter Heary, was fond of pointing out, two pages of the modern Electoral Act are devoted to an explanation of the conduct of the barrel draw for the order of names on the House of Representatives paper. That includes the rotation of the barrel, when and how the balls would be placed in the container and then drawn out. All right, so as I've just been talking a little bit about my take on some legal history, and as I do that, I can almost hear my friend and colleague, the current chair of the commission, the Honourable Justice Sue Kenny saying, don't do it, Tom, don't touch the law. That group will dissect you when you get it wrong. So let me, let me move on a little from the law uh, and annoying the legal minds in the audience and now cause consternation for the political scientists and historians in the room as I mangle some history. Closer to now, but still in the distant past, is what I think is the first epoch in Australia's electoral history. That brief and frequently electorally violent period between the first elections in Australia around 1840 and the points at which the secret ballot was introduced in each of the colonies. Now, many scholars have previously noted the disturbingly large number of media reports of election turmoil during that period. I commend to you an eyewitness report of two elections in the mid-1850s in Adelaide during the period of what was described as open voting. Now, the account, published some 50 years later in the Advertiser, described how the use of easily identifiable different coloured ballot slips to denote support for a particular candidate led to coercion and, not surprisingly, violence. A large police force eventually regained control by making some 30 arrests, and in a neat twist, the eventual winner was unseated by the Court of Disputed Returns, leading to another election with the same actual result and the same violent outcome. Those two elections occurred just before the Ballot Act was enacted in South Australia, and just out of interest, uh, and given some public speculation over the last few weeks, the Ballot Act proposed the marking of the ballot slip with a cross within the square. There was no mention of ticks. <laughs> the introduction of similar legislation in the different colonies was not without opposition. In 1855, the Attorney General of Victoria posited that a bill seeking to introduce the secret ballot was both unconstitutional and un-English. In the end, though, Victoria and South Australia led the way with New South Wales following. And interestingly, as people are probably aware, the secret ballot wasn't taken up in Britain until much later, and the same in the United States. Perhaps though, and this is probably the relevant bit to developments today, this is an example of the law eventually being deployed as it mostly and eventually is to protect the franchise in the face of developing societal issues. So as we leave that first epoch and head into the second, it would be much better for the narrative arc of my story if the secret ballot cured all ills and Australian elections were immediately transformed into the beacons of peace, tranquility, unicorns and love that they currently are. Sadly, there were still many examples of extremely poor behaviour, including the famous Murrurundi election riot in March 1872, the terrible violence of which was described as obnoxious to the ear and painful to the eye. There is even a more frightening story described in the Lismore Northern Star in December 1913, involving a candidate's very narrow escape from death as election violence in that region spiralled completely out of control. However, despite those episodic outbreaks of violence, uh, we can be comforted that citizens were mostly able to cast a vote during that epoch without the threat of violence, safe in the knowledge that their vote was likely to be counted as intended. And I don't want to truncate over 100 years of electoral history in one paragraph, but that second epoch ended, in my view, maybe in about 2012 or 2011. During the whole epoch, though, elections in Australia moved from bacchanal to barbecue, 
and became less violent, more inclusive and more professionally conducted. If you'll pardon me uh, mangling the French, the fin de siècle of the period was probably an article by Annabel Crabb in November of 2012, in which she said, Dear old AEC, after a recent close inspection of the US voting system, I return to Australia with a strong urge to kiss your feet. Hyperbole aside, electoral administrators at that point thought we were at the peak of electoral development in Australia. However, just like Francis Fukuyama's oft quoted prophecy of the end of history, we were wrong and we were also completely unprepared for the current phase of Australia's electoral system, the third epoch, the era of social media. Now, the, the referendum we're currently delivering and still delivering is the first referendum, but obviously not first election in Australia's history, delivered in the eye of the storm of the ubiquitous use of social media. There's a unique challenge presented by citizens constantly expressing their feelings about election delivery. It can be very disconcerting, disorienting, and it does require constant management. Our research after the 2022 federal election demonstrated that nine out of 10 Australians trust the AEC to count their votes accurately. That extraordinary trust quotient, which is just fantastic for national democratic wellbeing, will likely be hard to maintain in the face of that huge weight of social media commentary that's constant. That's particularly the case when much of that free evaluation of the AEC's performance is frequently untethered to the realities of legislation and occasionally even the laws of physics. Social media commentary on elections is more about the pub test and the vibe. The AEC is more about the law and the process. And this frequently sets up an online clash where commentators often say something like, well, I can't believe the AEC does or doesn't do something and then inserts something that is likely illegal, equivalent in cost to the moon landings or physically impossible. Now, we do need to be careful here, me included, we don't just collectively roll our eyes and wish that social media didn't exist. There are many different viewpoints here, which I understand need to be synthesized and clearly understood. There is a very significant truth in the view that access to social media has democratised the information ecosystem and really has provided ordinary citizens with a tool to communicate, to advocate and to be heard. On the other hand, the completely unfiltered expression of a range of views by anonymous posters on social media can create issues. This is particularly the case with citizens' trust in electoral outcomes. Now, just in case people think election management bodies have a glass jaw, it's not just us saying that. Um, uh, academics are saying the same thing and professors Holly Garnett and Toby James have posited how scepticism of election management bodies is magnified because they can be so easily criticised on social media. Professor Pippa Norris, who's been active in the electoral integrity space for many years, has gone further. She says um, that this ongoing criticism goes much further than just trust in elections and it can seriously undermine a community's general satisfaction with how democracy itself works. Now, distinguished guests, I must sadly tell you that we deal with a torrent of the most bizarre information through social media, and it's been steadily increasing over the last few years. Some of it is clearly random and individual. Uh, others we think may be orchestrated, however loosely, by particular groups. And just to give you some examples from the last referendum, uh, I was a commander in the United Nations and electoral events are therefore part of a fraud and land grab by the UN, whatever that means. I'm an operative for the deep state, that the AEC is secretly run by terrorists and that global elites chose the 14th of October as the referendum date to draw on the power of a solar eclipse. Now, perhaps my favourite is this one. So this is the guy responsible for delivering a free and fair election. I wouldn't I wouldn't trust him to deliver a pizza. Tom Rogers, ex-Raytheon contractor, United Nations Muppet, apparent Freemason and overseer of electoral integrity. And this was posted with a picture purporting to show that the Commonwealth of Australia watermark that appears on all the referendum ballot papers uh, isn't actually that. It's actually a mark of the Masons or the Rothschilds. So there are many, many issues that uh, continue to cause grief for electoral administrators with that sort of uh, commentary. Less funny and less quirky were the death threats made against me, 
serious enough to require AFP involvement, and other threats made against AEC staff, including filming of temporary staff in polling places, all of which required significant risk analysis by us before the event. Now, some of that commentary is so clearly unhinged that most citizens would immediately categorise it as tinfoil hat thinking, and we've been very vocal in calling that out. However, to, for my way of thinking, more insidious, more corrosive to the reputation of Australia's electoral system is the constant, and I suspect in some cases, loosely coordinated criticism of the AEC. Truly minor administrative issues, inevitable and inconsequential in a phenomenally large scale manual process, are then seized on, weaponised and maladroitly used to stake a claim that the entire electoral process is therefore corrupt. Now, this information environment is incredibly dynamic, uh, but we do remain at the forefront globally in dealing with some of those issues. Following the 2016 federal election, the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters, the JSCEM, acknowledged the new media and the case for reform. A particular focus was on ensuring voters understood who was responsible for communicating the, the communication that they were receiving and new authorisation laws resulted. The JSCEM also recommended changes to mitigate the potential influence of foreign donations, resulting in legislation banning political donations from foreign sources of $1,000 or more. Now, in addition to that legislation, the AEC also undertook a range of proactive measures to protect the integrity of Australia's elections. Now, I'm not able to discuss all of those in a public setting for reasons that you probably understand. But for the ones I can discuss, the most obvious has been our approach to social media. Having observed what occurred on elections around the world, I instructed our social media team to take a much stronger stance. This meant accepting risk, including the potential of public backlash if it went wrong, and having trust in our fantastic social media team. Now, the approach has broadly worked and has been acknowledged as an exemplar, including an Australian Financial Review article titled how the AEC faced the online trolls and won. We became known during the 2022 federal election for our open banter with citizens, the use of humour and our assertive approach to shut down commentary that undermined the integrity of the election. This included the publication of concise, simple videos of AEC staff explaining key facts about electoral processes. To be clear, when we talk about that, our focus is always on the electoral process itself and the legislation. It's never the topic, uh, electoral claims, candidates and other information, always the electoral process. Now, our approach continues to, uh, to evolve in response to the way the environment is evolving. And for this referendum, our assessment was that humour is no longer appropriate in most cases on social media for us as a government entity, as the commentary on social media seems to be becoming more transactional and, in my view, occasionally fraught. The AEC's relationships with the online platforms, critical to our strategy for managing mis- and disinformation, has been mostly positive and collaborative to date. However, it's no secret that the platforms are reducing their content moderation, in some cases quite significantly. This means social media users are even more likely to be confused as they are to be informed. And there seems to be a decreased commitment by at least some of the platforms to fighting mis- and disinformation. And the AEC is not alone in having to adapt to this new reality. Regardless, we are still attempting to flood the zone with accurate information, if I can repurpose a bad quote um, from overseas. We're continuing to invest, invest in our relationship with the platforms in an effort to navigate these challenges. Of course, there is a law of diminishing returns with these matters and it's becoming increasingly difficult to fight the tide and overcome some of these trends. To manage our relationships uh, and oversee this important area, I made the decision in 2022 to establish the AEC's Defending Democracy Unit, and I embedded this team into a new electoral integrity and communications branch, which still exists. It's become the locus of many of our efforts in this key space. Another key measure that we implemented in time for the 2022 federal election is the disinformation register online. Um, now that lists prominent pieces of uh, disinformation about the electoral process at electoral time, including details of the actions that we've taken in response to that. 
Now, it's a slightly edgy initiative, but it does enable us to assure citizens that we're actually acting on what they've given us, and it also enables us to maintain and enhance trust in the process. I might also add, by having that disinformation register online, it does add a layer of simplicity and accessibility for ordinary citizens who may otherwise struggle to get a grip on that level of information. Another layer of electoral defence that I can talk about tonight is the Electoral Integrity Assurance Task Force, which you may have heard about in the news. The task force, crucial in maintaining high levels of electoral integrity, consists of a range of Commonwealth agencies, including security and intelligence agencies, providing advice to me as Commissioner on matters that may compromise the integrity of electoral events. Established in 2018, the EIAT has supported all federal electoral events since then and supports state and territory elections upon the request of the relevant commissioner. In 2019, the AEC became aware of an excellent initiative by the then Swedish Civil Contingencies Agency, and I've had to practice saying that, it's such a mouthful. The Swedes ran a national campaign to inoculate citizens against fake news. They described the messages, if you wrap them up, as something like, if it makes you feel angry or excited, it's probably fake. <laughs> now, as an aside, I am told that the Swedish version of that sounds fantastic, uh, but I won't even um, begin to pronounce it. But we adopted this idea, and the AEC ran an Australian version called Stop and Consider in time for the 2019 election. That campaign, which was initially run absolutely on a shoestring, encouraged voters to consider the source of information at election time that they consumed on social media. Post-event research showed that about 20% of citizens recognised that campaign and many individuals told us that they modified their online behaviour as a result. The campaign was also noteworthy as it was one of the very few national campaigns aimed at raising levels of digital awareness amongst the broad citizenship. This campaign remains a staple of Australian elections, has been adapted by many of the state electoral commissions and has also been shared with our overseas colleagues. I might just close out that section on what we've done uh, by talking about our magnum opus, the reputation management system, uh, which Imogen mentioned before. Managing the reputation of the integrity of the election process and the integrity of the election management body is fundamental to citizens' confidence in electoral outcomes. In my view, some of the well-publicised election turmoil that occurred in certain overseas jurisdictions in the last few years was less a failure of electoral administration and more a failure of electoral reputation. Now, I don't want to talk about any specific country, but there's been a lot of coverage of, of some in particular. Um, but with that in mind, our RMS was a genuine attempt to further focus the AEC on electoral integrity and enable us to respond to critical issues. The RMS also helps guide our interactions with stakeholders and is centred on several key principles. And probably the most important principle is to put operational excellence at the centre of everything we do and build a reputation for ourselves as the nation's electoral experts through a proactive media voice. We have just developed uh, RMS version 2.0 and that document even better articulates the entire range of measures across the AEC which collectively underpin Australia's electoral integrity. As a framework, it provides a tangible connection from all individual tasks and roles across the AEC to our broader purpose, delivering trusted electoral events for all Australians. Let's move forward into where the gaps might be. Um, things become a little messier and more speculative here. And part of my nervousness is that I'm straying into areas where I know Parliament is currently operating. You'll all be aware that there is significant commentary at the moment regarding the Misinformation and Disinformation Bill 2023 and broad discussions sparked by a recent report by JSCAM regarding what I will, uh, let's call colloquially, truth in political advertising. I know you'll understand when I explain to you it'd be highly inappropriate for me to step in the middle of that debate before those matters have been fully decided by Parliament. I do, however, acknowledge this is a very fraught area as our legislators grapple with the competing demands of freedom of speech on one hand and regulation on the other, and keeping up with new developments. In some reports, including during the JSCM consideration of this matter, 
it's been suggested that the AEC might have a very significant role to play in determining the truth of political ad advertisements at election time. I don't intend to dwell on that matter either for the same reasons, it hasn't yet been considered by Parliament, and again, it's not my place to jump into that debate. I can say that we've made submissions to the JSCM. I do have views on that matter, but we'll wait and see what happens in the future. So moving beyond the legislative debate, something I think we can talk about is we think there is scope for further investment in national campaigns to increase the digital literacy of all citizens. Our research, after the implementation of the Stop and Consider campaign, broadly indicated that voters understood the campaign, they appreciated why the AEC was the appropriate agency to spread that message at election time. However, voters also indicated that there does seem to be a gap for an enduring national approach to arm citizens with the online skills they need to sort out truth from less truth at election time. I generally refer to that strategy behind this as pre-bunking, and you may have seen that as a term used previously, making people more digitally resilient and knowledgeable. In our experience, credulous individuals who use social media to express th uh, very strong views on electoral administration without any background on the law, regulations or complications of election delivery can be very easily manipulated and swayed by false information. Helping them understand the information ecosystem can assist them to contemplate the implications of their actions before they share questionable information and uh, we think that pre-bunking is far more effective than debunking in cases like that. The research for the success of pre-bunking rather than debunking is promising rather than overwhelming, but it's certainly worth further research. We've been advocating about this at various JSCM and estimates hearings. Uh, we've had broad discussions about mis- and disinformation. Now, essentially, I've indicated that inoculating citizens against mis- and disinformation should be a full-time process. And we're further considering how we might assist with this, hopefully as part of a broader government push. Well, I hope that during our journey this evening, you've heard more about Australia's electoral system than you thought you'd ever possibly need. Uh, moreover, I suspect I may have left you with deeply conflicted feelings of reassurance, but also concern. Reassurance, I hope, that the architecture of Australia's elections and its legislative underpinnings really are amongst the world's best and provide our citizens with a secure vote and an assurance that their vote will be counted as cast. Concern, perhaps, that the stunning increase in social media usage over the last decade does present challenges for electoral administration and indeed for us as a society. As I mentioned this evening, some work is being, do work is being done. Parliament is girding its loins to look at some of the possible legislative remedies and awareness of the problem is certainly high. To make our final democracy sausage reference to tonight, perhaps we could say things are generally going okay, the barbecue is fired up, but maybe the sausages are just starting to burn and the onions are certainly smoking and we need to pay attention. To provide some further reassurance as we wrap up, I do think that these issues are part of a continuum and that electoral challenges are eventually adapted and solved, either through legislation or through process, just like the introduction of the secret ballot. A relatively recent publication by the Commonwealth Secretariat makes the prescient point that democracy itself, including lifting the quality and strengthening the relevance of election management bodies, is actually a continuing work in process, at progress, and that's something I absolutely and wholeheartedly endorse. And just to finish, um, please allow me to acknowledge the many AEC staff who are here tonight and thank them uh, for the work that they do in, contribute, in contributing to Australia's democracy. That's it from me, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you.